Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today we get to speak with Michael Seif. He is a recovering Navy and airline pilot who frequently searches for the perfect longboard way to surf. Yet during his busier moments, he helps entrepreneurs upscale their productivity while still finding a sense of life fulfillment by integrating spirituality into their business. He is the author of Out of Dad's Box, how to break free from parental control and transform your life at any age, which helps people create a career independent of their parental expectations. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, Flavia. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So great to have you. Tell us a little bit about this journey from being a Navy and then airplane, airline pilot and then ending up where you are now. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting story. And I think probably what would be best to go back a little bit to, to talking about my dad my dad grew up in Kansas during the Great Depression. And if you think about the Great Depression, there, obviously it was a tough time financially, but it was one where in the Midwest, especially in Kansas, the Dust Bowl was going on. And so there was a lot of, a lot of poverty running around. And so he grew up in a household where his dad didn't work, didn't have a job. His mom was a school teacher and they had a really hard time getting by. And when he grew up in that environment, it was a environment of scarcity and lack. And when you're in that environment for a long period of time, you kind of adopt some of those traits and, and habits. And he, during the beginning of World War II, right before it started, he had gone to Kansas State University and had three jobs. He was trying to make his way through college and got accepted to the U.S. Naval Academy and now had the U.S. government, Uncle Sam, paying for his college. And Lo and behold, the U.S. went to war, and we know all about World War II. But you know, he survived, came came out of that, and had a marriage, had a first family. But late in the '60s, that kind of fell apart, and he met my mom, and he started a second family, and I came along. And growing up, I experienced a lot of challenges with him because he was one of those people who was very obsessed about control, and I think it all stemmed from his desire to react to the challenges he had of scarcity, of not knowing what the future was going to be like, of not knowing whether you'd have food on the table, not knowing whether you'd be able to pay rent or pay a mortgage. And so that kind of mentality for him, his way of dealing with it was control, control of everything. And so as a profession, you know, he was an engineer and then later he was a, an investment advisor. And so he had a lot of things that he did, little micromanaging kind of things that he did. And that spilled over into how he raised uh, me and my sister. And in particular with me, I was the only boy he ever had. And so he wanted me to have a better life like a lot of parents do. But in the process of, of that, he spent a lot of time controlling everything I did. And I was so excited once I got, once I graduated from high school, because now I wasn't going to be under his roof anymore and I could go away and kind of have some sense of freedom from the control he, he had over me. And I think to answer your question about like, how did I shift and pivot all? Part of it was my dad had, had driven ships in the Navy during World War II. And so he was what was called a surface warfare officer. And so I, in college, went to the U.S. Naval Academy as well, because that's what my dad wanted me to do. And I thought that would be a good thing to do. And I graduated from there, but I started making a shift. I started shifting away from what he wanted me to do. And it was just one shift, but I went into the aviation community and started flying while he had been a surface warfare officer. So I did the same thing my dad kind of wanted me to do, but I started shifting. And over time, I kept making more and more shifts. And what happened was I got to the point in my career where I had worked government, I had worked corporate, I'd worked military, and I became a senior advisor to a lot of top executives at corporate and government level and got picked to be a chief architect for a particularly large project. It was a project that was just under a billion dollars. And 
It had a bunch of hardware from different stakeholders. It had different software. It had uh, different data, some proprietary data. And so I was kind of in charge of integrating all of that from these disparate organizations and trying to pull it all together to make one big thing that was going to be really quite a powerful system. And I had been trained as a systems engineer. And so it kind of, I knew how to put things together. And while I could see how everything went together, the problem I ran into was that people didn't want to work with each other. And so instead of being like a chief architect, I became more of a like a, hey, how do I connect people? How do I manage people? How do I lead people to do things that they, they didn't want them to, that they normally just didn't want to do? And I didn't have buy-in from them. So I remember one day, Flavia, where I was at work and it was a long day on this project and I'd finally had this huge breakthrough where I got people to have buy-in and we made some significant progress that day. And so I was leaving work, heading out to the parking lot, you know, one of the last cars in the parking lot because it was a late day, but I was feeling really good because I'm like, hey, we finally broke through. And just at that moment when I was thinking like, man, this is awesome. I was thinking about, hey, if my dad was still alive, he'd be really proud of me because this is a pretty big day. And in the same moment, I thought of how proud he would be of what I was doing because basically I was doing the same thing he had been doing in part of his career. He had been doing a lot of research and development as an engineer. And here I was, I wasn't necessarily an engineer, but I was doing a lot of research and development on some pretty big technical projects. And I thought he'd be pretty proud of me. And I think he would have been. But at the same time, Flavia came this idea of, I'm not doing what I should be doing. Like this is, this is still his life. Even though I've pivoted all these times, shifted to become a commercial airline pilot. I became an investment advisor. I did a lot of consulting. I did some other things uh, professionally. Here I was in a corporate position and I realized I hadn't really shifted that far from what my dad would have wanted me to be doing, that I had other things in my life that were more important. And so that was sort of this aha moment of going from a big high to suddenly realizing, man, maybe I'm not aligned to what I should be doing in this life. And I think that might resonate with with some people because they're, they're wondering like, hey, is this, am I fulfilling my purpose? Like, what's my purpose? And so that was a, a big moment for me to, to realize that I needed a shift. And that's huge because it's not always parents, you know, society too also imposes certain goals on people, right? People grow up thinking, hey, I'm supposed to do this, or even things like I'm supposed to have kids, or I'm supposed to get married, or I'm supposed to have this kind of a job, whether it's the parent or some other force, or maybe a school teacher, or just your peers, you know, there are these expectations that are put in front of you that are not always self-selected. And it's interesting that you had a moment that was such a high, right? It was like this huge accomplishment and you were in that glow. And that's when you sort of realize, wait a minute, was this even my goal? You know, I just, I just like, (laughs) I'm at the top of Mount Everest, but did I ever want to climb it? You know, that's (laughs) right. That's a a profound moment. What did you do after that? Yeah. Well, I did some soul searching, right? I was thinking like, well, what did I really like doing? And I remember when I was a a Navy pilot, I was an instructor pilot and I would help new pilots go out and land on an aircraft carrier at night. And for those that don't know, like that aircraft carrier is a tiny little landing strip that's a few hundred feet long. And if you think about Chicago, Harrington National Airport or Dallas, Fort Worth, like those are some really big, long runways, 12,000 feet long. So landing on an aircraft carrier is hard. And then trying doing it at night when they're just a few lights and trying to fly off an instrument in the clouds, it can be very hard. So taking these pilots out at night, I was that, I loved it because it was that ability to provide a calm, reassuring presence to them so that they could release some of that stress and actually perform better and get qualified because that fear that's there was the fear of death, you know, r- flying into the back of the carrier or flying over the edge and running into the water. Like there's just a, a lot of fear that people had. And so I had a really good success rate in helping these pilots qualify and become naval aviators that could fly out and, and fly in harm's way. And I hadn't done anything like that in many years. And I realized that I really liked helping people out and providing some expertise in a specific area or certain areas that I was I was good at. And so that's where I started thinking about, well, what, what does coaching mean? And, and what is coaching doing? And I think everybody knows, you know, coaching is about, and at least in the industry, is about accountability and setting goals and meeting those goals. So for me, it was like, well, how could I bring that sense of, or that presence that I had when I was an instructor pilot to people who are going through life challenges or going through business challenges to give them the confidence that 
the choices that they're making are ones that will enable them to be successful. And so that's when I started this quest towards going, well, maybe it's time for me to work for myself and really do something that that has a, a bigger impact from a purpose perspective. So that's that's really what started my shift. The way you described landing on an aircraft carrier gave me anxiety. And I'm not a pilot and I don't fight that. So the new Top Gun movie, watching that, was it fun? Kind of like, haha, fun, you know, that you could be in that community in that world, or was it uh, like almost triggered all this past nervousness and trauma and just watching people do that. Yeah. You know, it's both the first movie and the second movie did capture a lot of the essence of what being a naval aviator is like. And there is a lot of competition. So that movie portrays that for sure. So many egos running around (laughs) and egos on jet can be a detriment, right? And so there's some great lessons in those movies. And of course, Hollywood does a great, Hollywood does a great job of, of playing up the story, but, but there are some moments that I think are very reflective of life where you have these challenges in life. Maybe you've had a close friend pass on. Maybe, maybe you got laid off at work. Maybe, you know, you're working on a real estate deal and everything fell through and now you have some huge debt. Like there are things that come up in life that are really challenging. So the movie, you know, I thought was was great because it shows how we can overcome adversity and there are different ways of going about doing that. And sometimes some, the old school stuff is the way to do it because, well, we've learned a lot along the way and experience has a lot to do with it. And so when you realized you loved and had a passion for being that that mentor, that coach, that trainer, that instructor, you had to then decide, well, what are you going to help people with specifically? Or you know, how are you going to coach them? How are you going to help? So how did you actually put together your business idea for what you do now? Yeah, part of it is is lifestyle. When I was 13, I got my first job and I started saving money from my job and I put it straight into the stock market because I knew that I could get growth out of the stock market usually and and get some bigger returns and and start making more money and like rich dad poor dad, right? Put some of that money to passive income growth. And I started doing that at age 13, so I knew that yeah, great it's great to you know have income from active income from working a job or something like that but i knew deep down that it's really all about generating enough to create passive income so i wanted to capture some of the things that i'd learned since age 13 you know whether it was real estate investing i'd done and 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 done that with my with my wife or whether it was developing some seminars or projects that, that generated income so there was the income side and the lifestyle side of what what that would look like. So I wasn't working, you know, 14 hour days as a startup trying to get things going that I had enough income on the side so I could break away from a full corporate job and and transition into a solopreneur kind of business. And so then it became, like you said, what was my sort of theme or what was I focused on? And I had relied on a lot of what I would say spiritual background. And I really love bringing that aspect into business. And if you think about spiritual, the term itself is so, so broad today, right? I think over 80% of the public say that they are spiritual in some way, but yet so many aren't religious nowadays. And so spiritual could mean, hey, uh, I practice meditation in the morning, or I do yoga five times a week, or I go to mass every Sunday, or I go to a Bible lessons group on Wednesday nights, like everybody has a different meaning for what spiritual is. But when I was looking around, I wanted to find a modality to coaching that would take advantage of a lot that I had been exposed to from a spiritual perspective. I'd had a near-death experience, kind of seeing the other side a little bit. So I wanted to capture what was life really about? What were some of the things that, that are so important to life? And part of that was trying to be able to create connection with people. And I understood that energy has a lot to do with that. And energy, by that, I mean, you know, we have our thoughts, our emotions attached to those thoughts, and the actions or behaviors we take with those thoughts and emotions, and those constitute our energy. And so we can have negative energy or positive energy. And for a lot of people, that can be a very spiritual kind of thing is to be able to shift their energy to one of gratitude, shift their energy to one of joy and peace from maybe feeling like they're frustrated with something in their life where their things just aren't going their way. And being able to identify both the conscious and the subconscious energy that's going on in our life, and then being able to be aware of it and change our consciousness to be able to 
go to something at a higher energy level. That really meant a lot to me because then you can transcend whichever people's backgrounds are. And that's a modality that I brought in to my coaching and it works really well with the clients I serve. And when you say near-death experience, how near to death were you? Yeah, this goes back to my dad a little bit. And, and part of the reason why I wrote the book was when I was like eight or nine years old, my dad and I were and my sister and my mom were sitting at the kitchen table. And my dad and I got in this little like jest argument, or at least I thought I was kind of jesting a little bit, but he got really, really ticked off. And he reached over and strangled me and choked me. And I collapsed. I couldn't breathe. And I collapsed, fell onto the table, and I was out. I was gone. And I was on the other side for not very long, but I was in complete blackness, void, couldn't see anything, no arms, no no body, you know, nothing. And I was trying to figure out where I was. And so, you know, for me, eventually that that shifted and I came back, my dad resuscitated me and and I was back. But I learned from that lesson that my my dad had control. Like there is, he was was the, the one who was in charge of the family and you can't mouth off to him. And from that point on, I kind of wondered what what life was all about because here I had seen that this material world just didn't exist anymore. Only I was a thinking consciousness, but there was nothing else uh, where I was, but it was definitely something. And trying to figure out what control meant and and how to shift away from somebody else's control was kind of the lesson I took from that. And when you wrote the book, what was the catalyst for that? Were you finding that a lot of people in your coaching circles, in a, you know, clients and students had the same sort of issues, obviously with their own nuance and you know, all parents are different, but was it a, a running theme? And, and that is why you wrote the book to help others break free from those patterns. Yeah, it is. You know, we all have our limiting beliefs, right? And And so where do those limiting beliefs come from? Well, if it's from a dominant figure or if it's from society, right? Sometimes we can get stuck in that. We we all do. So for me, the book was really about talking about just incremental steps. Like I started at the young age. Like what was was something I did when I was very young? And when I got away from my my dad one time and went to Colorado at an outdoor adventure camp, like the the love that was expressed by the camp counselors towards me was huge. And so one of the lessons in the book is I was like, find a support network that will help you at, at a young age. So maybe that might be sports, maybe it might be band, but find something that you could connect with others that share the same passion. And that'll help you kind of shift your mindset a little bit. And so the book was starting from that young age all the way through high school and college and then careers. Like I've had like eight or nine different careers all because I was trying to shift away into something that I loved doing or I was interested in. And the more I did it, the the more competent I felt about just tackling just about anything. And and that's that whole ability to shift uh, into something new was never like an overnight, like I'm going cold turkey on something. It's it was always just a, an incremental shift, you know, where, whether it was going from a Navy pilot to being an airline pilot or going from an investment advisor to being a, a consultant for business. You know, those things are all uh, shifts in a sort of a smaller sense than something big. And I think that's the point of the book is to make make gradual shifts over time to get to where you want to go. We live in a hectic world and all of the different careers that you've had and the careers you still have now today, they're pretty demanding. I mean, going, going looking at all of them and um, not very many pilots that I know. And I actually know a few people in the aviation industry, usually not really just like relaxed, chilled out kind of folks. There's a lot of like perfectionism and checklists and um, uh, sort of workaholism runs rampant, right? Even when you yep. think about the schedule of like a commercial pilot um, gone for days and, you know, short layovers and, and this and that, it's, very demanding. How would you describe your lifestyle today? And was it a transition that you had to make or, you know, have you always been this way? Yeah. Part of it for me, obviously, was that desire for a sense of freedom. And I think the thing that I learned early on psych- psychologically was, was when when you feel trapped, how do you get away from that and create a sense of freedom? And in the airline world, like I thought it was so much better than being in the Navy where I was gone for six months out of the year, out at sea, where back then we didn't have internet, we didn't have a lot of email. So it was hard to know what was going on in the world. So we felt very isolated. So being an airline pilot, suddenly it went from being gone six days, six, you know, six months out of the year to like, okay, like you said, six days out of the week. And yeah, things are pretty checklist oriented, but that spiritual side, that quest for growth and to to grow your soul. I think that was kind of the thing a lot of us struggle with today. There's this whole 
movement going on of people wanting to become basically having more purpose in life. And that's where you realize that the logical left brain analytical reasoning sometimes just isn't that important. When these life blows come or you see these wonderful things that might happen, like the birth of a child, those are opportunities for us to experience the better things in life. And sometimes that sense of freedom leads to being able to have those other things. And so that's like that's why I love to go find go surfing when I can carve out time out of my day so that I'm taking care of me. And, and then that way I show up better for the people I serve. And what are some you know tips you have for people that find themselves really not able to have that freedom. I mean, they're stuck right now, whether it's work or other circumstances, it could be their parents, right? What would you recommend as a first step in achieving more freedom and fulfillment in someone's life? Yeah, I always say start with the qualities. Start with what you want in something else. So what would be, if, like if you had an ideal job or an ideal business, what would, how do you want to feel with that business? What would you want to accomplish with that business? Not from a numbers game, like I want to have 18 million in sales or something like that. No, what would you want to, what kind of legacy or what kind of difference would you want to make? And those kinds of qualities that come from that, maybe you want to display perseverance. Maybe you want to have connection. Maybe you want to have experience teamwork. Those qualities, you focus in on the qualities and the emotion that that brings, and there's an energy associated with that emotion. And kind of like the law of attraction or, or something like that, when you are in that moment, feeling that feeling of those qualities, then you attract that into your experience proportionably to the occupancy of your thoughts. And so when we're feeling those qualities, then unusual doors will open up. A new job might open up or a new business opportunity might open up or an innovative idea might come to us. We create that space for for growth when we're feeling those qualities that we want to feel in that ideal position. And where do you see yourself a few years from now? So what's your forward path? You've had an amazing journey, your backwards path, right? Your memories, the things that have gotten here, but where are you going next? Yeah. You know, I think part of it is sort of a big picture of like, I, I think in today's day and age, we're we are struggling with this cancel culture. We're struggling with separation. We're struggling with, with all these diverse ideas. And really what we are disgusted with isn't so much what's going on as what's behind it. And what we really want is connection. We want to feel connected to humanity. And so for me, you know, it's one of like five years, 10 years from now, it's created a stronger community of connection because you know, we want to value each other as human beings. We want to support each other. And only then do we, you know, have a little more harmonious life. So that's that's kind of where I'm going is, is, is creating a, a stronger community and connection. And how would someone connect with you and find out more about your book and also your, your teaching and your coaching? Yeah, well, they can go to my website. It's at sipecoaching.com. And then there'll be a special link there to connect and they can get a free copy of my book. And then I also have an entrepreneur's mindset program. And what I, what I, you know, I normally charge for that, but for your listeners, I would have that available for them. And what I like to do is I like to have an accountability buddy so that, you know, we get so many wonderful programs that we can sign up for and we get really enthusiastic about them and jump right in. And then after a few days, Maybe we kind of lose some of the motivation to keep going. So having an accountability buddy to go through a similar program and go through the same steps and share with each other really creates a lasting effect. And so if, if somebody brings a buddy along with them to the signing up for the program, then the program's free. So that's where they can find me and, and also partake a little bit more. Amazing. And again, it's sipecoaching.com, S-I-P-E coaching.com. Michael, it's always so great to speak with someone like you who has seen so much, literally seen so much. And, you know, you've just had such, such a journey and so many different events in your life that have brought you to where you are now. But I love that you're then taking all of that and sharing it with others and helping other people transform their lives and uh, make those similar shifts um, to find their own spirituality and fulfillment and, uh, I know you help people increase their productivity and just become better entrepreneurs. So thank you for all that you do um, to give back to the world. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And of course, I've enjoyed being on the show. I really like your podcast quite a bit and have listened to a number of episodes. So it's a real thrill for me. Thanks for getting. Thanks again for being on. And uh, I hope to have you on again someday soon. Thanks, Michael. Sounds good. Thanks. Guess what, lifestyle solopreneurs? If you don't yet have an online business earning you enough passive income to live the life of your dreams, I'd like to suggest you consider trying out Kajabi. 
Kajabi is an all-in-one solution where you can create and teach online courses, publish a paid newsletter, launch a free or paid podcast, process payments, build one-on-one coaching portals for your clients, and much, much more. I personally use Kajabi to power numerous successful and profitable online businesses. Lifestyle solopreneurs, there's a free trial of Kajabi waiting for you at this link, www.kfreetrial.com. You can try Kajabi for free, no obligation, by going to www.kfreetrial.com. Again, kfreetrial.com, and that K stands for Kajabi. Starting an online business helped me break free from that corporate grind, and I hope it does the same for you. You have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and see you next time.